welcome to episode 173 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I am here with... Andrew Swafford. And Dylan Moore. In today's episode, we'll be talking about movies we saw this week in part one and in part two. We've had a little bit of a programming change. Instead of Twice Upon a Time, we will be continuing our series on the Archers with 1950s Gone to Earth. Because Twice Upon a Time is very, very, very difficult to find to watch. Sadly... Unless you want to sign up for some really sketchy illegal tube sites. <laughs> um, we wanted to do Twice Upon a Time because, um, you know, we're ending with Peeping Tom, which is a solo Michael Powell film. We wanted right. to do at least one solo Pressburger film. And he's only done maybe just that one. Yeah. Um, very, very few. Um, but, yeah, it, it lost history. Apparently it's like an early version of The Parent Trap, which sounds That sounds awesome. Interesting, <laughs> like directed by someone like him. <laughs> Uh, Could be huh. fun, you know. So it, we watched Gone to Earth. So we'll watch, we watched Gone to Earth. It's the it's an interesting one, definitely. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get into movies that we saw this week. Um, Andrew, you and I saw a a movie at, at this past weekend. The latest, one of the latest, I guess, because it's not just the latest. One of the latest from Hong Sang Soo, the yes. writer. In There's Japan. always multiple floating out there. <laughs> yeah, this is one of three that he came out with last year. Uh, after the day after in Claire's camera, but the but on the beach at night alone stars his current uh, muse. I guess is the best way to describe Kim, slash romantic partner slash romantic partner Kim Min Hee, who is also in his film last year, uh, right now wrong then, as well as this year's Claire's camera. Uh, we talked about her last year as well from The Handmaiden. Uh, but Kim Min Hee stars as this actress who is kind of just wandering around this seaside town in Korea and pondering this relationship that she is having with a married man who is also a director. That seems very on the nose for people who know, who who just were introduced to the fact that Kim Min Hee, an actress, is in a relationship with Hong Sang Soo, a director who's not married at the time, but has been previously married. Um, and, and over the course of the the time while she's in this town, she is uh, is kind of just hanging out with with random with random people. She has a, a a female friend who she spends the kind of the first portion of the movie with, and then the second portion uh, is reconnecting with it seems like people that she's known from her past that she hasn't really uh, seen in a while. Um, but yeah, Andrew, I know you're a, you were a big fan of Right Now, Wrong Then last year. Uh, what did you think of this of this one from Hong Sang Soo? I really enjoyed On the Beach at Night Alone. I still think that Right Now, Wrong Then might be my favorite Hong Sang Soo film, but this is definitely in competition with that one, um, mostly because of how great of a character that he has created with with Kim Min Hee's lead performance. Um, it is a very empathetic um, role, which. I think that a lot of times in Hong Sang-soo movies, we are mostly just meant to laugh at the um, buffoonery of some of these people. Um, especially the male characters. Especially the male characters. They are, you know, the word that I feel like is always most appropriate is dummies. Like, his his male leads are just <laughs> dummies all the time. Um, and on the beach at night alone, uh, we have uh, this character who is playing an autobiographical-esque version of Kim Min Hee, um, who, like you said, is recovering from this public scandal after this adulterous relationship went down. Um, and there's one slight correction that I want to make to your synopsis, Zach, which is that she, I think at the beginning, she is not wandering around Korea. But she's wandering around a town in Germany. Um, and then we see her wandering around Korea in the second part of the film. The film has uh, like a bifurcated structure. There is a number one that comes up, like a title card number one comes up before the German section, and then a number two comes up on screen before the Korean section. And one of the, the central mysteries of the film, I guess, is how those two sections relate to each other in time. Um, did the German uh, section of the film come before or after the Korean section, to use the... Uh, the phrase from Twin Peaks to Return, is it future or is it past? I guess that's the thing that uh, Hong Sang Soo wants us to puzzle over for most of the movie. All of his films typically have some sort of uh, structural gimmick to it. And at the end of this film, I was a little um, 
unsatisfied, I guess, immediately because I didn't feel like I had gotten like what the mystery was. Like it's a it's a much more um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like um, it's a it's a much more obscure gimmick it's, it's than obscure, like right now wrong then, which seems much more straightforward. And it's it's not an intuitive gimmick right like yeah as you said right now wrong then it is very clear the the minute the second section of the movie starts what the relationship of those two sections are um yeah and and this it, you're just like always sort of floating in space until the pieces snap into place the thing that was helpful for me was i watched this movie on vimeo because i got a screener to write a piece about it which i'm, I'm gonna do by the end of the week um, it'll probably be out by the time people are listening to this podcast, and I'll have more thoughts to share about the film. Um, I watched it on Vimeo, so I was able to go back through the film and sort of place markers, like timestamps, where different sections started and where it, they ended. And once I like took a really big step back and, and looked at it from that bird's eye view, this is a really um, beautifully and cleanly structured movie with the 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 different sections of it are all like very symmetrical and very um, intentional in like the way they have been laid out. Um, And it made me appreciate the just strange oddball structure of this movie um, in, in a way that I was not expecting to after, after being so like underwhelmed when it immediately ended. Right. So I think this is, it's like an interesting little puzzle box film that is also, like I said, very very emotional, very empathetic. Um, I think we could talk for a long time about um, the various party scenes in this film where uh, characters are, as they do in Hong sang Soo movies, just sitting around drinking soju um, and sporadically saying horrible things about each other and then just carrying on the conversation as if nothing had happened. Um, but there's there's this big like emotional rift inside um inside uh uh, kim min he's character that gets resolved by the end in a way that i found very cathartic um i will also mention like just offhand thing that i appreciate about this film uh as a horror fan uh, believe it or not there is like a slasher character in the first part of this movie uh Uh, that's not a spoiler because it's (laughs) It's in like the first thirty minutes, but I was not expecting that. <laughs> He's just all, always hanging out in the back of uh, of the frame, yeah. just just in the background. As the camera is panning, it will pan past him, and you're like, Jesus, what is that guy doing there? Um, and that that is just a a little structural element that I was not expecting from a Hong Sang Soo film. It is interesting how this guy kind of continues to make the same film over and over, always creating new gimmicks and always finding new ways to uh, keep the stories from being uh, too redundant. Um, and this, I mean, it, it to me felt very, very fresh, um, especially compared to like, I don't know, I really like The Day He Arrives and In Another Country, but those both feel a little samey compared to this this seems like hong sang su breaking new ground in a way um i don't know do you agree with that zach yeah i think that this one and right now wrong then there's a there's a somewhat of a challenge to it you you described it as kind of this the like a mystery puzzle box and i think that Mm -hmm. uh i i do appreciate that i think that that's one of the 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 hallmark qualities that i really enjoy about his films is that you're right they are kind of retreading on very 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 similar themes and similar stories but by inserting these these kind of as you say gimmicks into it 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 adds this this kind of interesting new layer to it that uh that that makes it something fresh something new um it's kind of a similar thing to uh what ozu does the Japanese director, would he, where he will revisit uh, past stories or redo stories, but in his case, he's generally coming at them from different time periods, different years, or just different age ranges. And I like that Hong Sing, when Hong Sing Su kind of does this, he's doing it uh, much more structurally, and it also uh, hinges on you know the, the lead performances from his actors, whether it's Kim Min Hee 
or it's Isabel Huppert in, in another country. You know, he has these these different actresses that or actors that will add this this layer to the to the film um, that makes it something much more uh, much more rich than than the previous one. But I really I really liked On the Beach at Night Alone. Uh, I'm a bit, just a giant fan of what Kim Min Hee has been doing recently, uh, and this one is very different from her performance in in Right Now Wrong Then, where um, she's she's in 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 that one she's kind of reserved but also curious, uh, and has some has you know has somewhat of a of an emotional. Uh, struggle that she's kind of going through but it's not as as you put it a rift in this one it's it's kind of in 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 right now wrong then there's it seems to be much more traditional kind of waves of emotion you can kind of see the it it getting more more strenuous as as a, a conversation moves along and like you described in this one it seems kind of like there's just this kind of ripped hole and uh that doesn't necessarily it, that, that that means that the emotion and the in, in just kind of, it will just kind of bubble up from anywhere it, it you never kind of you never feel something growing more and more and more it, it seems like an eruption will just kind of happen and get triggered just randomly right. uh and like you said it, it'll just uh it just kind of comes out and then and then recedes back in uh, it's 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 kind of it's it's kind of strange. I think that uh, it, it's a movie that I did while well, I enjoyed it a lot this first time. I definitely and I and I kind of felt this way with all of his all of the movies that I've seen of his so far. I really want to watch it again and kind of like you like you said, uh, be able to bird's eye follow the structure and and, and how he uh, moves around in the film because I, I on a second viewing of Right Now Wrong Then last year I became to appreciate it much more than the first time. But if you have the ability to watch on on the beach at night alone and have seen uh, Hong's previous work, I would I would recommend it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, but Andrew, you also saw a, a another new release this past week, which I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on because I haven't heard anybody really talk about it, uh, and that's Loving Vincent. Yes, Loving Vincent is a movie by two French directors. Is it? Are they French directors? I should have done my homework here. Uh, Dorota Kobila and Hugh Welchman. Um, And this is a biopic of sorts about Vincent van Gogh. Uh, It is an animated film. And the movie's claim to fame uh, is that it is the first ever oil-painted animation Film. So every frame of the movie is painted by hand uh, by one of 125 different professional painters who worked on the animation team. Uh, there are 65,000 oil paintings that compose uh, the, the images that we see in this movie. And hmm, what, what to say about it? It is, for, for one, like... When I tell you that this is an animated film made out of oil paintings, I'm, I'm sure that the immediate reaction is like, wow, that's really impressive. That must be very beautiful. And you would be right, uh, but that, that like mental understanding of what an animated oil painting looks like is, pales in comparison to what it actually is like to experience it move on screen, right? Like... I, I could not pay attention to the dialogue for the first 15 minutes of this movie because my, my ears were not functioning. <laughs> Only my eyes were functioning, and I was not even really looking. I was not really even making eye contact with the characters on screen. I was just watching the, the minute details of the brush strokes moving across the screen. It is, it is in that regard... An experience like no other animated film I have ever seen. It is something that you just have to see to believe it. And if you get a chance to see it on a theater screen, I would say that's the only way to do it. I think that this on the small screen, this might be uh, less uh, engrossing in that way. Um, especially because that element is really one of the only strong suits of the film. Like the medium they've chosen to make this movie in is the reason that you should go see it. Um, 
you should not go see it because the story is particularly engaging um, or the more like quote unquote cinematic aspects if you would like to imagine that there's a camera in this movie um, th those things are not really there um, I wanted to make a quick comparison to Hong Sang Soo because one way in which this movie is similar to Hong Sang Soo films is that um, they're composed almost entirely of dialogue, right? Hong Sang Soo movies are really just a, a compilation of scenes of people getting drunk together um, and making small talk. And sometimes that small talk is really awkward. Sometimes that small talk leads to uh, emotional baggage uh, being unloaded and, and relationships being uh, um, like damaged. But Hong Sang Soo. He said this in interviews many times, and you should go read Darren Hughes' interview with Hong Sang-soo because it's great. He has said that he intentionally avoids beautiful images. Like he places his camera in uh, a place that he thinks is going to make for a very ordinary, very mundane image. He does not want to wow you with the, the style of the film. He just wants you to take in what, it, what, what is the exchanges that are happening between the people. And this is also a film that is composed almost entirely of dialogue scenes. Um, even though it's an animated film and the sky is the limit in terms of what they can actually put on screen, what they choose to put on screen is actors' faces having conversations about Vincent Van Gogh. Um, and it's a, they did the oil painting through rotoscoping, so they actually shot, I'm assuming, a full feature film with live human actors, including uh, like Douglas Booth and Sir Ronan, uh, including and, and many other people. And I think that if this was a live action film, it would be one of the most boring films of the year. It is incredibly dull, uh, the conversations that these people have. Um, and like I said, I had a hard time paying attention to the first 15 minutes of the dialogue um, just because I was so enraptured by like the moving color and all the textures on screen. But I think that if even I was paying attention, it would be very hard to be engaged in it. You know, you have, you have a, this is sort of a Citizen Kane story where we have a character who's playing this like noir protagonist and he's interviewing various people trying to get information about Vincent Van Gogh. And you don't really get any backstory or context for who these people are that he's interviewing. You don't know why you should care about them. You don't really know how they differentiate themselves from any of the other talking heads in the film. And it almost feels like a documentary feature <laughs> um, of like art students play acting what they think the relatives of Vincent Van Gogh would have, the friends and neighbors and relatives of Vincent Van Gogh might have said uh, if there was a contemporary documentary after he died. Um, and it's, it's just, like, not an engaging story. And once you – I was a little bit interested in it once I realized, like, oh, this is going to be sort of a Citizen Kane-esque, Rashomon-esque uh, story where we're getting all these different, different um, viewpoints on who this man is, and none of them are going to mesh well with each other. They're all going to be contradictory, <laughs> and we're never really going to understand who the true Vincent Van Gogh is, and that's going to be kind of an interesting statement on celebrity and identity and blah, 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 blah. Um, but by the end of the film, they definitively answer, <laughs> like, who Vincent Van Gogh is and, and specifically how he died. Like, this is an autopsy on Vincent Van Gogh where they uh, try and debunk the, you know, the popular conception of how he died, which was suicide. Um, I'll go ahead and tell you, I guess, I don't think it really matters that much if you know, uh, that this film purports that Vincent Van Gogh was killed, uh, murdered by this really malicious young man who lived in his town. And like that is not a particularly interesting endpoint for a film to get to. Like that, that is a cool like discovery if that is a, a true historical thing. That would make a really good uh, like article that would change the art academic world or whatever. Um, but or wait, wait. Yeah, or if the reveal was that the one of the cast of characters, the talking heads that you were listening to, was the murderer. Saoirse Ronan <laughs> killed Vincent Van Gogh. <laughs> <laughs> is that no, what Lady Bird. Bird's about? That is what Lady Bird is about. It is. Uh, <laughs> she she God. takes on the name Lady Bird as like a witness protection thing. Like she doesn't want uh. her identity known. Um, but I would say that. You know, visuals and the medium of this film are astounding. 
Um, however, we have certain, almost certainly not gotten the best oil painted film. One day, someone will <laughs> use the same medium to tell a better, uh, and more cinematically engaging story, um, and it I'm, will be better I'm, than this. I'm film. pretty sure that the I'm pretty sure that the Boss Baby Two is going to be all oil painting. So yes, that'll be yes, good. please. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. There was one other thing I was going to say, if I can remember it. Uh, nope, it's gone. Sorry. Loving Vincent, um, see it in the theater if you can, but don't beat yourself up if you miss it, I guess. All right. Uh, uh, we have about five minutes left. Dylan, uh, you had a movie you wanted to talk about. Uh, yeah, sure. I uh, watched it just the other day, uh, Prince of Darkness. It's a um, John Carpenter movie that came out like 1987, I think. Um, and... It felt like an extension of his work on The Thing. It follows um, an old priest that dies and passes away in an old abandoned church that no one really goes to anymore. Um, and another priest, Donald Plaisance, um, a, a carpenter recurring uh, actor character, uh, shows up to basically uh, take his place. He finds a book that's about the... Uh, brotherhood of sleep and basically that brotherhood was like passed down the generations the tradition of uh keeping secret this tube full of green ethereal ooze that basically holds the prince of darkness at bay kind of is is the conceit of the movie and so uh the priest um don plaisance um gets the help of a of a um, old scientist friend to gather his graduate students together to uh, come examine the material and find find out what it is and maybe how to keep it at bay. I think is uh, is the main is the main conceit. Um, uh, my hesitation is just uh, how 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 strange that it like tries to overlap um, the two of this kind of um, religious tradition and then bringing over um, researchers to uh, and scientists uh, uh, to figure out exactly what uh, incarnates uh, this evil ooze-like entity. Um, and that's like part of the tension between uh, that comes to like a dramatic head in, in the middle of it between the priest and the scientist. Um, it, it functions a lot stylistically like the thing where it's it's a lot of wide angle views that kind of distort the edges of the frame and long hallways and and it builds that tension of like getting uh, all these people in one location and shuts them out in this case they get like trapped in the church the abandoned church by like homeless people because the homeless people are uh get possessed by uh by this ooze like evil entity uh somehow like so it <laughs> it is like uh, the 2000 year occurrence of the i think what it kind of hints at is some kind of eclipse that like activates this um this essence to try to find form um and so you get you know that kind of uh whatever manichaean version of evil with uh, the camera work of the thing, and also, of course, John Carpenter's score that is just like this bass line that feels like a, a off off heartbeat that that kind of keeps you thrumming through. Um, I think ultimately, uh, the thing is a better movie. Maybe just uh, I can buy into the conceit of it more, um, and you know how isolated they are as opposed to. This one is just like they're like on an abandoned side of town that uh, and they get trapped by homeless people that like uh, no one else, you know, knows is around like there's no cops or anything else, which I mean, is interesting in this class warfare kind of way. But like what it's working with is this weird duality of evil thing that is um, I don't know if I, I quite was able to buy into by the end but there's really like good uh, effects there's this uh one where uh a body gets propped up by ants that have eaten it uh ants and beetles i think that have eaten it and like basically convince 
the people inside that it is a real person and then it collapses and it is it's actually startling and really good but it's it like it's borderline a goofy movie uh for me as opposed to the thing which is like even though the practical effects uh Oh, I was just going to say, on that note of this being sort of goofy, I have recently watched two John Carpenter films that are a little bit off the beaten path. They're not his canonical movies. They're not the thing, you know. Um, and those were The Fog and Starman. And Starman feels full-fledged goofy. Like, I could just not... I could not take that serious that movie seriously for one minute. Um, and The Fog, the conceit of it feels a lot like what you're describing, which is just like this mystical force kind of like comes into town unbidden and everybody has to deal with it. Um, but I had a very hard time getting into the drama of that movie and just the central conceit of like space zombie pirates was a hard, hard thing to take seriously. So like, I guess my <laughs> question up. is, have you seen those two films and how do you feel like this compares to those? Um, well, I haven't, I haven't actually seen The Fog or Starman, um, so I can't make a direct comparison, but, I mean, it seems like Carpenter is still dealing with, like, similar conflicts and dramatic, uh, thematic material, right? Um, the, uh, specifically, there is this, uh, so, regarding the ooze, uh, as, like, a way that it, like, drips in, or shoots into people's mouths, and that's, like, a way that it possesses folk, and they're... There is definitely, so unlike the thing, uh, there's actually female characters in here. So there's, there's a lot more of like, uh, a sexual tension that goes on. And the fact that the evil enters into people, mostly through their mouths, uh, there's, there's, there's like, uh, unnerving body horror stuff. And that, that it doesn't, it plays with it and it, and it's uncomfortable part of the tension, but even, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to deal with it. I, I feel a little unfair that I have to deal with it in relation to the thing, but the thing is so good that, uh, <laughs> that it kind of, yeah. I mean, John Carpenter's hits, it feels like to me are just so many like miles yeah. beyond his misses, um, you know, like they, they live in Halloween yeah. and the thing just feel fundamentally different from something like star. Yeah. Uh, but, but I, I think economies where it, it plays with really good effects and it has that style that ropes you. He's good at crafting an image even if the drama isn't there. Like, the ending of The Fog is really incredible work with silhouettes and, and gl- special effect glowing red eyes and this weird uh, glowing cross that they had made for the movie. Like, it just, it just creates these, uh, like, monumental images in a way. But the movie that surrounds it does not necessarily support those. I can imagine the same thing being true for... Prince of Darkness. Finally, uh, maybe something that actually might get people to watch it is this uh, um, sending uh, dream images back to stop the apocalypse from happening. And so there's like, uh, that gets playing that it's like a shared dream among uh, okay. all the people that are in the research team, uh, which it, it kind of ends on that, but there's a twist that I don't necessarily want to spoil if, if the concept does interest you. Um that it kind of is it something we need to know if if we are indeed being sent dream images from future uh, apocalypse preventers? It it still kind of leaves it up for grabs a little bit, but but the central image, yeah, the the central Im- image that it ends on at the end basically does a reversal uh, on what happens, and there's a, a, there's a sacrifice that happens at the end that is like really good not dramatically but visually because the glass glue i was thinking of a uh, super mario 64. oh yeah yeah for sure yeah there you go <laughs> jump through the painting but um anyway uh for if anybody wants to see prince of darkness is it is it streaming anywhere or is it on dvd is that a scream factory movie maybe i was lucky um a dvd so uh it i think because of that release it might be pretty easy to get a hold of uh, right now, so. All right. Uh, we're going to take a short break. We will be back talking 1950s Gone to Earth after this. Hello, Cinematary listeners. This is Andrew Swafford with an important message during this break in the show. 
Cinematary would like you to know that we do not want your money, and we don't want to place ads in the show at this time. That's not why we do this. We do it because we enjoy each other's company and because we want to bring you our pure, unadulterated opinions on the world of cinema. However, there are a few things you can do to help out the show that we would greatly appreciate. Firstly, leave us a review on iTunes, preferably a positive one, uh, because the algorithm gods tell us that reviews increase our podcast exposure. Secondly, send us a tweet at Cinematary, or better yet, send an email to cinematary at yahoo.com so that we can hear from you guys for a change. Maybe you think I'm an idiot for not liking Singing in the Rain, or maybe you have a suggestion of a movie that you really want to hear our opinion on. Regardless, let us know your thoughts, and we'll read them out and respond to them on future episodes of Cinematary. Finally, please share the show with friends and members of your family who you think would enjoy listening to and participating in our film discussions we bring to you guys every week. So to recap, uh, review, send us your thoughts through Twitter and email, and share with your friends and family. We would truly appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the show. back with part two of episode 173 in this part we will be continuing our series on the archers with 1950s gone to earth uh the film stars jennifer jones david farrer from black narcissus and cyril cusack and it follows a young woman who lives out in the country in the 1800s and becomes intertwined in a love triangle between two suitors a local squire and the town minister uh, the, the film is based on the 1917 novel of the same name by author Mary Webb. Uh, the novel was all but ignored when it first appeared, but became better known in the 1930s as the neo-romantic revival Gathered Paste, even inspiring a 1932 parody, Stella Gibbons' novel Cold Comfort Farm. Wait, the sorry, film... I have to interrupt you. <laughs> neo-romantic revival? Yeah. What is that? Wow. It's the new romantic revival <laughs> that happened I in the need, 1930s. I need more information, Zach. <laughs> it's when all the... Uh, it's Is when that when the, all uh... movies are about living in the woods? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like... Um... Really loving nature, you know? Yeah, it's like... All right, let's look up. Neo-romantic. It's uh, it's it's a variety of movements in philosophy, literature, music, painting, and architecture, as well as social movements that exist after and incorporate elements from the era of Romanticism. It okay. was was as best ah. has been used with reference to the late nineteenth century composers such as Richard Wagner, uh, and and it's synonymous with the age of Wagner. Okay. That doesn't apply. It also applies to writers, paintings, and composers who rejected, abandoned, or, or opposed realism, naturalism, or avant-garde modernism at various okay. points in time. From so we are talking about like down to the present. William Wordsworth, Romanticism, that kind of Romanticism, or that kind of uh, yeah, yeah. So we're in safe territory here. I just got done talking about uh, teaching Romanticism for a week, so I just wanted to make sure that's what that meant. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. Nice. I knew what it was. Cool. <laughs> the film was significant. Sure, you did. Significantly, ch- I did. So did so did Wikipedia. Um, the film was significantly changed for the American hey, yo, market by David L. O. Selznick and retitled *The Wild Heart* in 1952. Selznick, who had a penchant for dictating long and rambling notes to his directors while under the influence of amphetamines, flooded the production with memos, most of which were studiously ignored. Powell summed up the relationship this way: "We decided to go with David O. the way hedgehogs make love." Very carefully. (laughs) Although he had been involved throughout the filming, executive producer Selznick disliked the finished film and took the Archers production, uh, the Archers to court to get it changed. He lost the court case, but discovered that he had the right to uh, to change the film for its American release. Consequently, uh, he re-edited and added some extra scenes that he shot in Hollywood under director Ruben Momillion. 
uh, to make the known to make the Wild Heart in 1952. Uh, his changes were mostly additions to the film, a prologue, scenes explaining things, often literally by putting labels or inscriptions on them, and more close-ups of his wife Jennifer Jones. The most infamous of the alterations are the scenes at the end when Jones is supposedly carrying a tame fox, and the additional scenes she is carrying carrying. What is obviously a stuffed toy uh. fox. Uh, he also deleted a few scenes that he felt weren't dramatic enough, some of which were major plot points, so the story doesn't make as much sense as it does in the original film. In his autobiographies, Powell claimed that Selznick only left about 35 minutes of the original film, but in fact about two-thirds remained intact. Wow. Overall, Selznick's cut of the film uh, of the film's length by uh, cut the film's length by 28 minutes from the original 110 minutes mm. to 82 minutes. I wanted to also read this letter that Selznick wrote to Ben Hecht, who he wanted to do who he wanted to help with uh, the Wild Heart. He said, "Dear Ben, I would not do it unless I kn- uh, knew that it would not make you. I, I, I would not do it unless I knew that it would not make take you more than a few minutes and accept." that it has become almost a tradition with me to have you wave your magic wand over our four words. Also, believe me, I will feel no offense if you tell me that you have changed your mind and that you just don't want to be bothered with it. I have done my best to struggle with it alone, as on previous forwards to minimize your work. (laughs) What I need are a few of your magical (laughs) phrases and a tapping of your apparently inexhaustible supply of graphic adjectives. The picture is gone to earth, which is the source of most of my arguments with Corda. It stars Jennifer, and I am therefore dubly... Doubly concerned with it. It was made by Powell and Pressburger, who are a very d- gifted pair, as I think they have dist- demonstrated in Red Shoes, Colonel Blimp, and some other films. But despite their great talents, with the exceptions exception of Red Shoes, they have they have had an astonishing degree of failures. They've had two tremendous faults. Uh, the first is an excessively English resistance to portrayal of emotions, which I am hoping to cure with retakes and additional scenes following completion of the job of re-editing the film. And the second is a fantastic obsession against making things clear. I think there are a great many pictures that are helped greatly by a forward, even when the picture doesn't have the problems to overcome that this one has in its present form. And an outstanding example of this was your brilliant and widely quoted forward for Gone with the Wind. Sign, uh, signed, David. Can I a question again? Um, so, did you say that Selznick's version is eighty-two minutes, and Powell and Pressburger's was a hundred and something minutes? One hundred ten. Yeah. Okay. So, we were talking before starting recording this, saying that we probably watched the Selznick version because there were things that were added to like explain to American audiences. Uh, so, we did not watch the Selznick version. No, we watched we watched the uh, Powell and Pressburger version. Okay. Good. I would have been very bummed out if that was the only thing yeah. we could find. Yeah, <laughs> This movie is available uh, on YouTube, by the way. This is how we had to watch this movie. <laughs> that's true. Uh, studio filming took place at Shepperton Studios in Shepperton, Surrey. While most of the film was shot on location at many sites around uh, much Winlock in Shropshire, England. Uh, many local people were recorded as ec- uh, recruited as extras. For instance, the choir <laughs> from the local Methodist church appears in the film. When director Michael Powell heard them sing, he thought they weren't ragged enough to portray a choir of country folk, <laughs> only to be told, but we are country folk, Mr. Powell. In 1950, the BFI uh, reviewing the film said, it is difficult to know what to make of this film. The original novel is absurd enough, but Mary Webb had at least a passionate abs- absorption in her weird rustic world and attempted no more than a tragic little story of a pagan child of, na- of nature hunted like her pet fox to death by human beings. Powell and Pressburger appear to have inflated it to an allegorical statement of spiritual and carnal love fighting it out over an innocent being, and their slow, stilted, portentous uh, method makes the slight story even more ridiculous than perhaps it is. In 1950, the TV Guide said a, called it a rare misfire from the normally reliable team of Powell and Pressburger. In 1986, the monthly film bulletin in a re- retrospective said, The complexity with which Mary Webb interweaves her character's motives and destinies seem almost impossible to reproduce in cinematic terms. But in spite of Powell's reservations of, about the script, his and Pressburger's version comes very close. The book resounds with elemental imagery through which states 
of mind and impending events are reflected in natural phenomena, not so much uh, pantheism as Darwini Darwinian materialism, seeing physical drives rather than spiritual ideals as determining human life. Low angled shots of black trees swaying ominously are occupied by a soundtrack of hunting music, thudding hooves, enchanting voices whose reverberations have almost physical impact, both invoking the black meat in Hazel's, eye, Hazel's mind and creating a more general sense of dark, hostile forces threatening humankind. In another retrospective in 1997, Jonathan Coe said about the movie, See, uh, see the film again today, and its melodramatic story soon recedes into the background. What ravishes the eye, eyes and pierces the heart is an astonishing series of pastoral tableau. Uh, the the long shadows of birch trees as they lean into the wind against a sky of impossible blue, a bleak mountainside at twilight, its rocks sculpted into a symbol, into the semblance of uh, contorted monsters, silvery trails of mist shrouding a desolate country ho house at dawn. Rather than bow uh, bowing every time to studio-bound convention, it's important to attempt these rare mysterious excursions into Brit Britain's unvisited corners as Michael Powell's failed masterpiece continues at so potently to remind us. So on that note, um, what did you guys think of Gone to Earth? It seems like when it came out in 1950, it was yeah. kind of dismissed. At least the contemporary reviews uh, said yeah. that. While failed you know, was... masterpiece is a very strong phrase. Well, it, it seems like the retrospectives and in, in, in you know in the years following seem to find a little bit more in this movie than people did initially. But yeah, what did you guys think? Um, Dylan, I'm gonna throw it to you. Okay. Um, so first, uh, a little bit more context. Uh, I, I think to help set up some of the uh, whatever um, production context uh, that Zach also uh, talked about with Selznick, that there's this really good podcast. Uh, you must remember this: that um, uh, Karina Longworth does this series about MGM and specifically dedicates two episodes to uh, Selznick, and the second part is about his. Uh, affair and then marriage to Jennifer Jones that kind of results into this and how he seemed to have seen her as this innocent sex goddess, you know, uh, <laughs> that, that's trying to, you know, hold those two things together at the same time that, uh, that he, that she kind of became his, uh, obsession and muse and that kind of resulted in a lot of weird, uh, parts of production. And so, uh, a note she also adds in there that she, uh, she, Jennifer Jones, seems to do her best work when it's not under Selznick's uh, uh, tutelage and mentorship. So I, it is notable that this happened in another country where Powell and Pressburger straight up said, ah, we're just going to ignore his uh, uh, intense memo. So uh, I think that's pretty funny. And definitely that podcast is worth a les listen if you want more context to uh, how this got set Do up. Do you know so. if uh, Jones and Selznick's, um, I don't know how to describe their relationship, uh, but their weird power dynamic in that relationship uh, was like uh, common knowledge when uh, Gone to Earth was made. Um, is is that some like is this something that he is trying to get us to look at in the movie, or is it something that Powell and Pressburger are trying to get him to look at? That's a that, uh, that's a good question because it seems like part part it's just an unconscious thing uh, for him so it's just kind of the way he is so to say that there is like a a self conscious urge to do this is hard hard to say as a motivation but I would say there's some of that for our character uh, the squire or whatever that's uh, abusive oh, and yeah. aggressive with uh, Jennifer Jones's character uh, for Selznick because. It, it, the way uh, she told the story is that it made it seem like he did really love and was obsessed with Jones, but actually wanted to stay with his first wife, Irene. And so there's kind of this resentment for it that uh, mm -hmm. when Irene wasn't going to have it anymore, that uh, he had to marry Jones at that point, And he kind of, he was not happy about that. And then at the, the point this movie was made, apparently they were kind of in dire financial straits and so he couldn't get a lot of work done except uh loaning out jones to different studios to get her to star in movies and so they were kind of Yikes. uh hanging out with with the money that she was able to bring in because he had a lot of gambling debts apparently so uh, 
anyway, there, yeah, there's, there seems to be some biographical overlap, but uh, how much of that is conscious, I, I'm not, I'm not, I can't. It's hard to say. So, what do you think of the movie? Uh, I like it a lot. I think it, uh, I mean, it continues a lot of the thematics that Presper, Colin Pressburger did in Black Narcissus and Red Shoes, but yeah. it, for me, it culminates in Jennifer Jones's performance and her character. Uh, mm-hmm. that I, I, I liked a lot. Um, I think I mentioned, uh, maybe the last time when I was on here, how much I like Clooney Brown. So she's kind of the star in that too, that there's this, I'm, it's not a feigned innocence, but especially here, it's kind of holding both of these things at the same time that she seems naive, but it's actually, she just is kind of whimsical and follows her whatever instincts. Yeah. So uh i so regardless of that that as a premise i think she pulls it off really well that there's a way she has like control of her presence and like her 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 face that it it can like turn on a dime of Mm -hmm. of one set of emotions to another of like severe hesitation and then kind of leaning in into uh whatever those more uh quote-unquote base thoughts or whatever so uh yeah for that i to your point so it it does feel like she has much more of a centrally uh, important role in the movie than, for example, the lead in the Red Shoes. Yeah. I mean, I love the Red Shoes, but that that film seems to mostly be focusing on the male machinations around that character, and and she the the, the protagonist of Red Shoes mm. kind of just amounts to a victim. Yeah. Whereas even though in Gone to Earth, uh, ultimately. this is ultimately a victimized yeah. character as well, I feel like I have much more of a sense of her like emotional uh, reality. Yeah. Um, I, I, the, the guys who are being manipulative and awful to her in this movie exist much more on the fringes. Um, and I, 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 know where, I know where she's coming from, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I see that for sure. There's... Um, Maybe, I mean, especially in the context of the Red Shoes about performance, that it's, like, more visibly dictated as, as like, she's under uh, those constraints. And even in Black Narcissus, there's that, whatever, the holy order and the, and the promises you make that kind of keep them visibly constrained. While here, it's looser, the countryside's more open, and yeah. and there's those pressures, even mm-hmm. from, like, uh, the, the minister's mother and, like, all the women and men in the town that kind of know her as this kind of um, uh, gypsy woman that uh, is whimsical and not to be trusted or reliable. And there's, so that, that stuff is there, but it's like, it's like this more indirect thing. So, and this is um, sort of tangential to what you have said, but you said the word countryside and that sent me mentally off into a different direction, which is that uh, I was really surprised to see, so many shots and so many scenes in this film that are clearly not on a soundstage. You know, when I think of yeah. Powell and Pressburger, I think of these uh, like grand puppeteers almost who are uh, constructing these uh, grand artificial realities um, and, and all these set pieces that they, they center their movies around um, that are like these big mechanical contraptions. And, even the scenes that are uh, ostensibly outside, like in Black Narcissus, those like Himalayan cliff sides, are so obviously fake. Right. right. Um, and, and in a great way, they're obviously fake. Um, and this movie, I think, was actually filmed right. in many yeah. uh, stretches out in the middle of the woods, uh, <laughs> which is, is really interesting considering like how much, how tightly controlled it seems like Pres- Powell and Pressburger want their sets to be. Um, they're venturing off into Malik land and, and having to deal with the sun. Uh, and they, they, they use it in some really beautiful ways. Uh, I, I think this movie is just as like sumptuous, I guess to use a cliche word, and uh, like consistent in terms of color um, and, and light and uh, uh, texture throughout the film as, as all of their other movies are. Um, it is almost as if they are in control of the weather and the seasons <laughs> and things like that. Um, so I, I was, I was, you know, impressed by that. Yeah, for sure. I, cause they, uh, whether or not they were actually, you know, able to control it, they were definitely able to use it for, 
uh, expressed uh, uh, expressive purposes, right? That they were able to make it feel dramatically purposeful, even if, uh, you know, they're not the masters of weather. <laughs> uh, one shot in particular, I'm, I'm starting to lose images of this movie, um, but one shot that does stand out to me is I, one of the first scenes with um, uh, Jones's character, she's like standing in front of a, um, gosh, what do you call a clock that's that they use the sh- the shadow of the thing when when uh, no sundial sorry sundial wow. yeah <laughs> uh, she's standing yeah. in front of a sundial um, yes and the sundial is not in the center of the frame necessarily yeah but it's the absolute focus of your eye line because the sun is just it's it's like a, a mirror top almost it has this mm. uh, um, shiny uh, surface at, at the top of it and the sun is yeah. like gleaming off of that sundial not onto jones's face but off of the sundial like directly into our eyes um and like she wanders away from it and our eye line follows that um but like the sun is like always directing your field of vision in a way mm. um but there, there are a lot of uh, great um sequences with like weather in the sky and sunsets and things like that that um are, are eluding me now, but maybe Zach and Dylan, you can uh, bring some of them to mind. I'm I'm, I'm going to be that guy um, and say <laughs> I, I wasn't as impressed with this one as I have been on the other ones. I I kind of I Fair. kind of felt uh, you know the opposite of of what you just described with a lot of the visuals where um, I, I I I was kind of bummed that we lost that. Uh, that controlled reality because in this one, it, the visuals weren't bad. I wasn't like, this is terrible, but it seemed much more subdued. <laughs> it seemed like uh, that fantasy was was kind of lost. And I think that there's, a, a, you mm. know, this kind of a, a little bit of an absurdity to the plot that you have that that requires well, yeah. um, that requires that fantasy. And since it, it, because the the film to me just kind of lacked that, it just didn't work as as well as the Red Shoes or Black Narcissus you know, worked in that regard. Um, I didn't dislike it, but it it it's def, it definitely felt to me like the like the weakest of the one of the Powell and Pressburger movies that we've watched so far, just because it seemed. It seemed to have all of the elements that you would, that you've grown accustomed to, like Dylan, like you said, with their films. But it seemed mm-hmm. like it was doing that, uh, in a in a way that wasn't reminiscent of what what those other movies excelled at doing. I think it is visually. I I, yeah. Sorry. This is. Uh... I was gonna say I think it is visually and dramatically no, stronger than Matter of Life and Death. I don't, I'm not going to go to bat for this against the other films that we've talked about, but certain, certainly that one for me. Yeah. Zach, do you still disagree? Yeah, because I don't know. The, 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 uh, I think that <laughs> in, that, in, in that film, the, the absurdity of that plot, I, I, I think I, I was much more willing to accept the absurdity in that plot than this one. This one just felt... It, this one just felt a little bit more incomplete. Like, like I said, it, it like there was elements that that coincided with a lot of their other films, but it seemed like it didn't all coalesce into one, um, one complete package. It, it seemed there like... are things that um, feel left out of the movie, and it's interesting to see that Selznick stripped more mm. things away just at to troll people i right. guess to to keep them from being able to understand the plot the one thing that stands out to me in the 110 <laughs> minute cut or the 100 minute cut um is all the stuff that's foregrounded about like spells and the occult mm-hmm. um it really oh, seems yeah. like that is going to come mm-hmm. to a head at the end of the movie and it just never does and there's even a thing at the very beginning where she comes well, home um, after like running through the fields and we're seeing her like um, yeah there's all these match frames uh, or um, 
match cuts of her running through the fields with animals running through the fields. Like the camera's looking at her mm-hmm. in the same way. And she comes home and she reads this thing about like they're coming or they're here. And I think I'm about to watch a horror movie and it never is really explained what exactly that note was. Yeah. About. <laughs> I, 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 I disagree. I mean, I think there's, yeah. Uh, 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 implications or kind of assumptions of maybe familiarity to some of it, but I think there's an, enough there because I mean, it, basically begins and ends in the same way except at the end you know the drama has turned so much that it, it ends in her death but i think the book actually s- says as much that uh about the huntsman and when it's whatever between dusk and and uh night or whatever and you hear the horns don't turn around or you're gonna die and that there's there's that on top of that whatever promise she made to God's little mountain about the mm-hmm. marriage thing and that she broke that promise and that <laughs> those two things uh, do culminate. That's what it is. Okay. That's, so that's so now that we're talking it, right? about the marriage and we're talking about elements of the plot that do or do not make sense, I think now is the time to reveal that I did not understand a goddamn word of this <laughs> movie. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's how, fair. How I was there, too. It's uh, it's astounding to me that that little factoid that you read at the beginning, Zach, that um, Powell and Pressburger wanted the um, country folk to ham up their accents more. <laughs> because how can you ham up your accents more? I, Zach, can you do your do your impression of Gone to Earth? I'm just just rhyme, 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 bring pressure, rhyme, 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 rhyme. Oh come on. <laughs> I'm being, uh, I'm being I mean, talking about drum drum jar. You're yelling? I've, uh, it's I, 90% of the film is that. No, I mean, I feel like uh, it, for me it wasn't that bad. I mean, I think the more egregious one or the one that was most noticeable to me was Jennifer Jones just because that's not her accent or whatever. So I could tell that she was doing it, but she did it well enough that I completely let it go. But everybody else, I don't know. That like to have the 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 valet butler grouse about totally worked. I mean, you I knew enough of what he meant and what he was doing. Yeah. There's not like I, I mean, I, I knew I knew very early on that I was not going to be able to follow some of the dialogue, especially because there were no subtitles in the yeah. version that we had to watch on fucking YouTube. But, there was Spanish um, subtitles, but I don't think that was <laughs> oh, were there. I should have turned those on and just like practice Spanish. <laughs> So I used it as an exercise of like how well can I follow the plot just through blocking and images yeah. and body body language and yeah. cinematography and stuff like that, which is nice. And I think the movie totally works. And you know, I, I still maintain that I like this more than Matter of Life or Death. Definitely like it more than Zach does. Um, but I am still a little bit unclear about the marriage plot thing. I know that at one point she promises her father that she's going to marry the first man who proposes to her, but like she. Yeah. What does she get she out of actually, that deal? Like, what's the context of that deal? Well, she didn't. She just promised the the mountain. I mean, it happened to be for her father, but she promised whatever the mountain, which I guess it, you know, sacred place that uh, the first person that she meets that want that ask her to marry her, she will. And but why? I think, why well, is like she the, compelled to promise the mountain anything? Uh, I, the mountain ask? No. What? Uh, it had something to do with the father not wanting her to be around. I don't know. That was that's a good point. I I can't remember. I just watched that scene like an hour ago, and I cannot remember. There, there. I mean, there's like a a lot of tension of her not being married. I think it basically came yeah. out of her father saying, "It's like, isn't it about time you got married?" And that's kind of it. Uh, so I don't, I mean I don't know. You know, they they have a weird relationship to begin with. The, 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 but the, the the essential problem is, you said, the father talking about. We don't understand what the father was talking about at any point in time. Oh, God. <laughs> he was uh, speaking. Sh- and he's a, I he's a delightful him. character. I uh, really like spending time with that character. Didn't understand character. a word he said. He's like uh, yeah. just uh, by himself and can't handle the daughter anymore. And that's kind of it, I guess. I mean, <laughs> uh, right. as weird and messed up as that is, that's kind of the situation. So yeah. uh, that at that point, she's like, yeah, sure. I will promise the mountain that I'll marry. And then so like the uh, second act tension whenever is who's going to get there first, the priest or the, the squire. And then the minister does. So, you know. 
I, th- I think that, that that's where my my biggest issue with this story lies is the kind of yeah. the call to, to the call to romance. I guess for for lack of a better phrase was was yeah. less. I, I didn't. I was less compelling than what we've seen previously. You know, I'm thinking of in like sure. a matter of life and death. You have the whole like you know almost dead situation that kind of you know pushes that relationship into happening. Okay, but the whole idea is that she doesn't want anything right. to do with right, either right. of these yeah. guys. Like, really. if we as an audience mem- or we as an audience are compelled to ship one of these romances, <laughs> the movie doesn't work because we don't empathize with her. Like, she has no like romantic bone in her body. She's just getting married because she feels obligated. I to. mean, I, she wants to hang out with her fox. God yeah, damn I, I mean, I'd slightly disagree with that. That Who, I think foxy? she's interested but like no <laughs> darn it that that she's interested but like in a playful way not in the domestic i'm gonna get married kind of exactly way. that that i mean if anything else i think the movie may be more a little bit on the minister side but he's kind of like the uh, two milk toast and then that's you know we're ultimately meant to empathize with her so like seeing him just like promise god that i'm not gonna ask anything for her and just kind of like dude what do you okay? I mean, I know you're a minister. Well, I thought but, the uh, the way they handled the minister character was really bold because um, I at no point did I feel like I was supposed to be on the minister's side, yeah. even though the movie sets up in the first act the fact that the other guy is just straight up abusive. Right. You know, like he he sexually assaults her in the first scene they have together, and yet she willingly leaves the minister to go to him right. um, in, in, a, in a scene that also communicates to the audience that she's only doing any of this stuff out of some weird misplaced sense of obligation. Yeah. Um, yep. But I think that the movie somehow manages, and I don't know if I can quite articulate how, uh, it somehow manages to make us hate the minister just as much as that other guy. Like he is well, yeah. the quote unquote nice guy version of this brute well like uh by the end of it they basically bring him into a character arc of of the squire pulling out him uh, the minister's uh asshole side or whatever you want to however you want to phrase that where like he's more stern with everybody and that you know he's going to get his wife back and then it's just like oh oh minister oh oh god he, mm-hmm. you, you've turned a corner uh and i'm not sure if the movie is necessarily wanting us to hate that, but it uh, it definitely makes him less of a likable character, f- for sure. I mean, just in relation to just how much uh, the guy who is the epitome of that in this movie, the David Farrar character, is just just kind of an aggressive dick, and so it's just not uh, mm-hmm. not super appealing. And, and, and considering how like uh, uh, thematically and visually they like set that squire character in like this red orange hue where he's always, he's Oh my like, gosh. He's, Thank you for mentioning red orange. Hues. Yeah. He, he um, gets like that. Cause we got to talk red about profile light in some scenes and somehow they managed to like situate a lot of conversations between, uh, the squire and Hazel, uh, Jen- Jennifer Jones's character next to fires. And it's just like, Oh Ugh! my gosh. Yeah. And, and it's just very um, uncomfortable. There's this one where it's, during the uh, country fair and that uh, this was after she promised to marry the minister and Farrar doesn't know this yet and he's been searching for her and he spots her and basically like corners her after the dance or like during the dance. And there's a candle yeah, behind or in them front of them. I can't talking, tell. Right between their faces. And it's so stressful. <laughs> like, and it, it comes back at the yeah. end, like that visual motif returns um, when there's the showdown, for lack of a better word, um, when they have the, the the squire and the minister in the same room and they are just like vocally fighting over Jones. Um, and there's this spectacular shot that I have no idea how they got it to where like we the camera seems like it is placed inside the fireplace. Um, and we are we are watching these like this triangular, um, like uh, arrangement of these three people from within the fireplace. So the entire yeah. frame is covered yeah. in fire. And I think there's also like some candles hanging out in the back too. And the shot was already like 
all done in orangey red silhouette. Like the first time the, I don't know if it's the minister or the squire. I think it's the squire when he like darkens the doorway and the minister and Jones are talking. Um, God, that is like, I wish I could just um, link people to the image because I don't have an awesome way of describing it. It is an ordinary looking silhouette, but the, the colors that have pervaded this house are so uh, uh, unreal in that Powell and Pressburger way. Like th- this is this is not reality. This is not even what the most beautiful like magic hour twilight uh, sunset would make the inside of your house look like. But it like in this house, it is presently hell because all three of these people have converged together. Um, and I like I said earlier, I think that the uh, the colors and the just the aesthetic qualities of the film carry throughout the entire thing, even though they're they're dealing with outdoor sets and they're dealing with weather. Um, like I think that that shot at the carnival is an outdoor scene, but they managed may they manage to use it in a way that is still very controlled and, and foregrounds that that climactic moment really well. I mean, some of it is like, uh, I mean, at least with the nature shots, is that it's just specifically portentous, like a lot of hanging clouds that make it feel ominous that they might, whatever, yeah. overuse. But I, I, I think, it to your point, that uh, for me, it works. Um, and <laughs> even, even like the Disney almost uh, tale of uh, the animals scurrying away, right? That it's... It, it, yeah. It gives the film sort of that very, mystical, very romantic quality situation. Um, and I, at least with the drama of the movie, I mean, yeah. it's around the triangle, but I, I think it works because so much of it is like even outside of that triangle, that social influences that pervade it into that place, right? Like there, earlier on, there's like a lot of shots where when uh, Hazel's in her Sunday best or whatever, and there are all these men mm-hmm. that ooh and ah and <laughs> do a lot of stuff stupid stuff like a flugel horn blowout and uh uh, silly stuff like that and then uh at the end you get more of the uh, minister's mom not thinking that she's a good influence and her point being proven or whatever when she goes with the squire character and then and then at the very end what pisses off the minister or whatever is when the the elders or the dudes of the town show up and it's like you guys need to leave I mean, or you can stay minister, but she needs to leave. And at that point, that's just like, you know, that's that's where the th- the drama and the thematics of the movie come yeah. to a head, where she basically gets hounded into a hole, right? That that that, but 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 not even not even. I mean, the the huntsmen or whatever start it, but what ultimately kills her is things that are out of their control. The hounds, right? that actually force her that they they actually want to help her at the end because they're realizing oh god we're not just hunting a fox they're going after this woman and that the hounds still chase her and that because she's trying to protect foxy who gets out a lot and gets chased by the hounds that she falls in that infinite tunnel that's in the middle of the hill yes we need to talk about the ending um (laughs) i i had not thought about it that way of the ending kind of giving you this reversal um look at nature where na- nature becomes very malevolent and and we've only associated yeah. nature with this you know uh sprightly innocence throughout the entire yep. film um, sure. i was i was just looking at the ending as being very bleak which it still is about um you know Welsh, the patriarchal yeah, yeah. culture of um is it wales i think, I think it's wales uh, this like yeah this welsh uh, society um being being so um restrictive that a woman like Jones could not exist in it. Um, but the fact that nature is involved in her death complicates things. Um, I still really wish yeah. like Powell and Pressburger could have like found a way to save her, but um, they're, I guess that's consistent with what they've done in the red shoes. And I don't remember, does, some, does a woman die at the end of Black yeah. Narcissus? <laughs> one of them yeah, Byron yep, dies. The one that's, yeah. that... <laughs> But yep. y'all get get ready for peeping tom next week. Oh, God. So so many women being slaughtered in that movie. Uh, um let let's talk also before we wrap up about the very end of the movie. Okay. <laughs> Which is to um Earth. so <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> There's this ridiculous like button at the end of the yeah. movie where she has just fallen into the 
infinite like Mario hole uh, in the middle of the wilderness. My second dun, Mario dun, reference. Dun, in this dun, 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 dun. Um, and, Have you been playing and, Mario Odyssey? Is that what this is? Uh, not not as much as I should. Okay. Um, and the name of the the film snaps into place for you. Like, oh, she's gone to earth because she falls into the earth i yep. see what you did there pal and pressburger not a great title but i see what you did there and then there's this wide landscape shot of i think the sunset and well can you do it again gone Zach? to earth Yes, it's someone like yodels the yeah. name of the movie to us yep. and just to make sure we made that connection yep. That's what happened. She went to Earth. I. You're welcome. I think they were trying to make it seem more foreboding than that, because uh, again, they do it at the <laughs> at the beginning. But to to your point, when they did it at the beginning, it still still felt like more like a horror movie because we never saw the Huntsman and the music that kind of culminates. Wait, do they say "Gone to Earth" at the beginning of the movie? I think so. I'm pretty sure. I they don't do. remember that. Uh, Gone exactly. to Earth. <laughs> <laughs> they just say it periodically okay, throughout but, the entire but, but, thing. But <laughs> that's the mountain. Yeah, that's, that's how the, the mountain how the talks. Mountain she speaks. thought he was saying get married, and he was just going gone to earth, which is just gibberish. <laughs> but they speak gibberish, so, so they didn't know. That, yeah, uh, that's the thing. Is like her accent is so thick, she yeah. interprets the words "gone to earth" as uh, get married to the first man who asks. I be getting uh, married, y'all. Y- 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 uh, okay, but so I don't know if that's think, actually like a folk turn of phrase or whatever. I mean, we understand enough what it means, but like, you know, like why would they emphasize it if it's not supposed to be like, I don't know, that that kind of material. I I I don't uh, know if it's a common phrase. I've yeah. never heard. Of well, before. I didn't. It doesn't necessarily that we had to have heard it, but yeah, I'm I'm, I'm looking it up I, right now. I mean, I'm, I'm a little rusty on 1800 slang in Welsh countrysides but i think it is a, you know something that was used a lot um uh, let's go ahead and kind of and kind of wrap up as we as we're getting okay. on, getting high on time uh it's any, any Zach, what are your final thoughts um i don't know i i, I felt like I, maybe i was much harsher on the movie earlier than i really like i didn't i really just i didn't dislike it like i i, I did enjoy it but um I don't know it, it it just for me it just was missing a quality of the previous Powell and Pressburger movies that we've watched so far that really um resonated with me um I don't know maybe it's maybe it's a, a movie that I should rewatch again and and try to let, focus less on the broken English and more on the story Ooh, man yeah. if it ever gets a good transfer with yeah. subtitles I will yeah. rewatch um, it definitely immediately I have a, a couple thoughts. One, it, it like brings uh, together some of the material that they've worked on before that we haven't exactly seen a lot yet, which is about the countryside. Like uh, Michael Powell early on did this movie called Edge of the World that is specifically about this um, Scottish, the Hebrides uh, community. Uh, that is just a lot about how they live and how the community breaks down at the end. And it's really melancholy. It's in black and white. And I think it's on Filmstruck. But then also the, the movie that Pressburger and Powell did together called uh, I Know Where I'm Going. That's about this city girl that goes to the country and, you know, has to reexamine her shit. But there's, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of interest, I think, for Powell and Pressburger to bring, uh, not so, like not the main British narratives or or, 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 or colloquialisms that are like London based or around the uh, the official side of things or whatever. And I think this mo- movie does a lot of it on the fringes, right? Like to all the side characters. I mean, including the dad and the butler character, but even the fact that a lot of these events are around festivals and socials, and that there's this extra material that sets it in a time and place that I think they do so well that um, helps base it. And I mean, even though if you don't connect with the drama immediately, I think it definitely gets can get you there with the atmosphere and some of the fringe settings and character. There's one part at the very, I think at the very beginning, after she gets back and goes into town to get a new dress or whatever, and she meets up with her cousin 
and her cousin is like selling margarine and like could not impress on this dude that margarine is just as good as butter because he under butter needs no he, yeah no gosh. butter needs no explanation and the fact that it's made out of vegetables just confounds uh, the dude and so that. It, <laughs> and he yeah. also flirts flirts yeah. with uh, the butter protagonist by saying that she's butter. I thought that had to have been a colloquialism, but I guess you're right. It is just another uh, food that he so, wants to eat. So, uh, you know, some of that is more goofy, and I, I think in a positive way for the movie setting than others. But it, it, I think it does a lot for yeah, yeah, yeah. for their films. Uh, this extra material. So, two closing thoughts for me. Um, one, I know that go to Earth is an actual idiom. Um, Maybe this is not news to people listening to this podcast, but uh, <laughs> according to idioms.thefreedictionary.com, they say, go to earth means to hide at a location where one will not be easily found, and, get this, a foxhole in the UK uh. is sometimes called an earth. And so in hunting, the expression used to refer to a fox uh, who has gone in its foxhole is a fox has hidden in its earth. So nice. that kind of reframes Thank the ending you. of the movie. A, nature has chased her into this place, but also she's going into a foxhole to be with Foxy in a metaphorical <laughs> way. Uh, by like, the way, I was literally. so sad when we find out via letter that uh, she left Foxy with that goddamn uh, minister. Um, God, yeah. Miss Foxy. Um, what are you about but to say, he, But the minister makes Foxy a little house. That is adorable. <laughs> Which is pretty good. <laughs> the minister almost <laughs> redeems himself. Um, my last thought is that people should go listen to the Kate Bush album, Hounds of Love. Oh, yeah. Which the go. cover of that album <laughs> is probably a reference to Gone to Earth. And she also did an album called The Red Shoes. So she knows her pal in Pressburger. Um, oh, there you go. That's all I got. All right. Um, well, that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can uh, find us on social media at Facebook at Facebook.com slash Cinematary, at Twitter at handle at Cinematary, and on Letterbox at Letterbox.com slash Cinematary, where we uh, post all of the movies that we talked about in this episode. Next week, we will be concluding our series on The Archers with 1960s Peeping Tom. So, we're going to get nice oh and creepy. It's rough. It's going to get nice and creepy. Accurate. <laughs> It's and like colorful, the Psycho but... was agonizing. Oh, God. Oh, that's a nice way to put it. I think that might actually be a selling point for some people, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's what it is. All right. Thank you guys for, for listening, and we will see you next week. to work.